On Spiritual Friendship, Part 2 Sources of the Spiritual Friendship It is not necessary to make an elaborate investigation to discover Alarad's basic source for spiritual friendship. At the very beginning of the book, he recounts his discovery of Cicero's D. Amicitia, while still a schoolboy, and the profound impression which the work made on him. Considering that the work was very popular in the 11th and 12th centuries, it is not surprising that Alred should have seen it. We still possess a copy from the Durham Library, which Alred may have read. But it is a bit surprising that a work so essentially secular in character should have considered to make such an impression on Alred after his conversion when, as he notes himself, Nothing which was not salted with the scriptures was to his taste. But for Alred, Cicero's D. Amicitia has served a function very like that which the Hortensius served for Augustine, turning him from trifles towards God, and Alred never put Cicero by, as Augustine had the Hortensius, in his rather more drawn-out progress towards sainthood. A glance at the notes, especially of the second and third books of the Spiritual Friendship, will show how thoroughly Alred relied on Cicero. There is hardly a page on which some quotation, or at least some allusion to the Amicitia, does not appear. It is estimated that fully one-third of Cicero's work is contained in Alred's. Cicero's influence, however, goes even beyond the substance of the arguments, since the very form of Alred's work is in great part derived from the De Amicitia. Cicero divided his subject into three parts, the nature, advantages, and the laws of friendship. And Alred observed a similar arrangement of the discussion in his three books. Likewise, although there were only two speakers in the first and least Ciceronian book of the spiritual friendship, the last two books have the same number of speakers as Cicero and leave the greater part of the discussion to the central authority figure. The works even close in the same fashion, with Cicero giving an account of his protagonist's friendship with Scipio, and Alred speaking of his own monastic friendships. However, although Alred took Cicero for his master at the matter and even in the outline of the spiritual friendship, he did not hesitate to adapt him when he was insufficiently Christian, and even to differ with him on some points. Thus, the definition of friendship, which is quoted directly from Cicero, Alred made it clear that he used it only provisionally, and felt free to drop all the qualification, all, from Cicero's phrase, agreement on all matters human and divine. On an even more basic point, Alred differed with Cicero when the De Amicitia fell short of Christian standards. Cicero had suggested that we should follow the wishes of a friend, even if by some chance the wishes of a friend were not altogether honorable, provided, however, that utter disgrace does not follow. Alred rejected this opinion with vigor in the name of his more developed understanding of friendship as a species of true charity. Therefore, let their opinion is to be detested who think that one may work for a friend against faith or honor. Behind this general consensus with Cicero lies hidden Alred's general agreement with the whole tradition of Greek ethical philosophy. Cicero's own sources are mysterious, though a lost work by Theophrastus has been suggested. 
a general resemblance in the outline of Aristotle's Nikki Nikiomanachian ethics is clear, though it is likely that Cicero did not know this work directly. Alaric himself could not go behind Cicero, and we need not either. The scriptures and the writing of the fathers of the second of the major sources of Alaric's ideas, insofar as his sources have been identified, Alred's familiarity with the fathers does not seem to have been ordinarily wide, but he had made a profound study of a few major patristic authors whose works were available to him. Among the fathers, Augustine was clearly Alred's favorite, and his favorite among Augustine's works was undoubtedly the Confessions. Walter Daniel tells us that Alred had in his hands the confessions of Augustine, for it was these which had been his guide when he was converted from the world. Walter also reports, at the time of Alred's death, the books which he had in his private oratory were a Psalter, the Gospel of John, and the Confessions. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that Alred painted his own youth in Augustinian terms, describing his overwhelming desire to love and be loved. The model of human psychology, which Alred used, is also Augustinian in its outline, although that dependence is clearer when he is discussing such matters explicitly in his De Anima. As a result, his spiritual friendship gives the impression of a thoroughly Augustinian structure, built on the foundation provided by Cicero. The doctrine is expressed in scriptural and patristic terms, but is no more a floriologium of the fathers than it is a simple copy of Cicero. Alred was aware that the fathers sometimes differed from Cicero and from each other, and he was willing to differ from certain parts of the tradition, thus in spite of his devotion to Augustine, and the particular delight he took in the confessions, Alred felt free to express a far higher valuation of human friendship than Augustine had allowed after the death of his friend. For all his dependence upon Cicero and St. Augustine, Alred was sufficiently in command of his sources to be able to suggest graceful syntheses of his often differing and highly sophisticated materials. He resolved the conflict between Jerome's assertion that true friendship is eternal and the careful directions Cicero gave for breaking off an intolerable relationship by insisting that although the love of friendship is eternal, Vice or malice may destroy the affection which is the temporal element of human friendship. Finally, Elred, like all the authors of the heroic age of Cistercian literature, found nothing that could totally seize his affections which is not sweetened with the honey of Jesus and salted with the salt of the Holy Scriptures. Years of daily contact with the scriptures had made their language a part of his nature, so that he, like most monks, thought and wrote in biblical words without conscious quotations. There are thus references and allusions to scriptural phrases on every page in the spiritual friendship, even though many of the references are not exact quotations. It was not necessary for Alred to cite the scriptures, or to check his references. Instead, the phrases and examples came to his pen almost automatically, expressing a way of thought more than the authority to be cited. Since there is very little abstract discussion of friendship in the Bible, Alred could not find there a doctrine to combine or contrast with Cicero's. But the scriptures do have both an elaborate doctrine of love, 
which Alred had already discussed in the Mirror of Charity, and a fund of epigrams and examples of friendship which can be quarried from the Old Testament. The examples of friendship which are to be found primarily in the historic books are not the most conspicuous borrowings of material from the scripture. Alred consistently replaced Cicero's examples drawn from classical history and mythology with material from biblical history. Not only are these biblical events more likely to be familiar to his readers, but they also have a warmth and immediate appeal which the heroes and gods of classical antiquity conspicuously lack. There are also a number of brief epigrams from the wisdom books of the New Testament, which are referred to in the spiritual friendship. In most cases, these references are incidental and are used to sharpen or emphasize a point rather than to establish a principle. Thus, the verse from Proverbs, A true friend is a friend forever, emphasizes Alred's contention that friendship, as a virtue, is eternal. It is interesting to notice that in the spiritual friendship, Alred almost completely neglects the technique of allegorical interpretation which he used with such virtuosity in his sermons and the little track on Jesus at 12 years old. The only exception is a brief package based on a verse from the Song of Songs, a work so popular with the Cistercian authors for a profundity of its mystical content as to be almost impossible to avoid. Nevertheless, in deference to the rules of the philosophical genre in which he was writing, Alred carefully abstained from mixing in the sort of allegorical material which would have been appropriate to a work of edification. Alred's use of the New Testament is equally pervasive and equally subtle. The Gospel, according to John, the Gospel of Love par excellence, was one of Alred's favorite subjects of meditation, as it was St. Paul's doctrine of God's free and unconditional love for men. Direct quotation from St. Paul is relatively rare in the spiritual friendship, but St. John provided Alred with material for some of his most striking phrases, such as the celebrated epigram, God is friendship. But perhaps even more striking than Alred's confident reworking of his sources is his independent sympathy with the human humanistic tradition. There is no need to insist that the first half of the 12th century was an age of Renaissance, or to suggest that classical literature and the value were cultivated in the schools of all Europe. The north of Britain, too, had its own tradition of learning and had played a noble role in the preservation of the classics during the dark days of the barbarian invasions. Especially in Durham, that tradition had never been forgotten. Alred was very much a part of that tradition of classical education, and it was a happy fusion of his own personal needs and the opportunities of his tradition, which enabled him to create the classical Christian humanism of the spiritual friendship. Even in the style of the book, the fusion of these two elements is obvious. It is rather a commonplace to contrast the monastic style with its leisurely development and constant half-conscious reminiscence of scripture with the bare technical prose of the schoolmen it is true that both in their sources and in his style alred is typically monastic his language is clear simple and generally closer to saint jerome's vulgate than to cicero's public style there is a restraint to his style an avoidance of the merely rhetorical, which is classical in the best scene. 
Although steeped in the writings of St. Augustine, only rarely did he employ the conceits of the late Roman rhetoric which St. Augustine had taught and used. In fact, when Peter of Blois rewrote the spiritual friendship at the beginning of the 13th century, one of his major concerns was to embellish Allered's classical simplification with Baroque ornament. Allered's prose also lacks the supreme polish of St. Bernard's finished works. Traces survive of drafts for some of his sermons and portions of the spiritual friendship, but Allred did not have the time or the inclination to revise and polish as carefully as St. Bernard. He persuades not by the massive display of authorities, nor by the brilliance of his style, but by his intense sensibility to emotions shared in some degree by all civilized mankind, and by reason also of a vivid power of self-expression. Alred in the Tradition of Monastic Friendship In Alred's spiritual friendship, we have both the supreme achievement of monastic speculation on friendship and the high-water mark of that tradition. As is often the case, the partial and scattered opinions of the theorists of friendship found their best developed and most profound statement at just the time when the winds of change began to set against the monastic reform movement and the intimacy of monastic life as a whole. As has been pointed out, the earliest monastic authors had been ambivalent about the value of a particular friendships in the monastic community. The dangers to the spiritual life of feudal, of pseudo-friendships, leading to factions and the danger of sexual temptation, has led most authors to stress the exclusive desire for God at the expense of the emotional satisfactions of love of neighbors and friends. Thus, when Cassian treated the subject of personal friendship in the conferences, the weight of the discussion fell on avoiding anger and distraction from the purity of the love of God, rather than on the spiritual advantages of love between brothers. The literature, of the, the literature of the Carolingian survival of the religious life is equally focused away from the particular friendship of the cloister. Mother A. M. Fisk has collected citations from Al Kuhn to Wallafrid Strabo, showing that reformers and missionaries of the 9th and 10th centuries were alive to the needs and advantages of friendship and felt free to use the rhetoric of friendship. In almost every case, however, the emphasis is on a rather conventional and formal friendship, imitated from late Roman models of politeness, rather than a true and deeply felt intimacy. This is not to say that Carolingian authors are insincere, but simply that they stress the obligations of mutual aid and kindliness rather than the union of souls in a relation of disinterested spiritual love. It is only in the 11th century, at such centers of monastic revival, as Beck, that spiritual friendship in the cloister itself enters the monastic tradition. In the charming and childlike person of St. Anselm of Canterbury, we suddenly see the rhetoric of epistolary, epistolary friendship fuse with the inarticulate friendships of monks to become genuine spiritual friendship. Anselm developed a spirituality of friendship as an aspect of pursuit of God, both in letters written before leaving Beck for Canterbury and in his beautiful Prayer for Friends. Once occupied by more complex and troublesome affairs as primate of all England, 
he displays in his surviving letters a more reserved and formal tone. The beginning of the 12th century was marked by the proliferation of new orders of monks and canons, whose fervor and enthusiasm went beyond the respectable, if slightly tepid, monasticism common in older Benedictine houses. This new fire could not help but encourage and spread the devotion to spiritual friendship. St. Bernard and William of St. Theory, while retaining the natural distrust of those pseudo-friendships which could be so destructive in communities where the temperature of the monastic life was not kept at a pitch of white-hot fever, wrote vividly of spiritual friendship. Their enthusiasm refused to be satisfied with the dry prudence of earlier authors, and they boldly explored the most shocking metaphors of the Song of Songs to express the energy of their passionate love. It is in this context that Alred's spiritual friendship must be read. Alred was never indiscriminate in his enthusiasm, nor imprudent in his optimism, but he had the confidence typical of the early Cistercians in the fervor of his audience. He did not hesitate to warn of the dangers and snares of false friendships, but clearly found the advantages of friendship for the truly spiritual man outweighed the dangers to the unconverted. Such fervor and purity of Intention is rare enough in this world. However, within a few years, a decided reaction had set in. After Alred's death, his successor found it necessary to appeal to the Pope for action against fugitive monks. Clear evidence that even at Rivaux, the heights could be inhabited only for a brief hour. The monastic order as a whole suffered the same fate as Riveau. The greatest days of the Cistercians were over by the death of Bernard in 1153, though the prestige of the order remained exemplary for several generations. Writings by monastic authors on spiritual friendship almost disappear. It is true that Alred's work was copied many times and surviving manuscripts are very widespread. Copies still exist from France and the Low Countries as, as well from all parts of England. His work seems, however, to have inspired no successors in the monastic tradition because it was found to be a completely adequate treatment of the subject or because the subject no longer regarded with the same favor. Outside the immediate monastic milieu, the reaction against spiritual friendship was slower in coming. By the end of the 14th century, there were at least four short versions of the spiritual friendship in existence, one of which had achieved the honor of being attributed to St. Augustine. The authorship of most of these versions is unknown, although one may in fact be a draft from Alred's own hand, and another is contributed in the manuscripts to Thomas of Frockaham, an English Austin friar from the 13th century. This particular version, which combines portions of the Mirror of Charity and the spiritual friendship achieved considerable popularity. Six manuscripts survive from as far away as Spain. Even more popular than these versions, however, was the full-scale plagiarism which Peter of Blois undertook at the beginning of the 13th century. Peter's work, titled Christian Friendship, is a careful rewriting of Alred's spiritual friendship and mirror of charity. Large portions allow Alred to closely that it is possible to amend textual corruptions in Peter's work by comparison with Alred's text. The major changes are the results of a considerable 
expansion of the text of the flowery rhetorical style popular with cultivated readers in the 13th century. Peter's text itself enjoyed a false attri attribution to Cassiodorus in a number of manuscripts, adding one more author to the number of those who have been given posthumous credit for Alred's labors. Even in the lay world, Alred's spiritual friendship seems to have achieved considerable popularity. A translation of at least one part of the work seems to have been undertaken by Jean de Mune, author of The Romance of the Rose, though no trace of this version survives. After the 13th century, the influence of the spiritual friendship becomes more difficult to uncover. Don Ansel Post has suggested that Peter of Herentals, a 14th century premonstration prior of Florefe, was acquainted with the work, but after that date the traces of Alred's influence were lost to our view. The late Middle Ages and the Counter-Reformation shared a distrust of the particular friendship, which at times borders on the neurotic. Friendships of any sort were banned from the cloister, and the most ordinary of personal contacts were viewed with deep suspicion. Only in the 20th century has Alred's work again received its share of popular attention. As modern moral theology has turned away from the abstract and defensive attitude of the handbook scholasticism, and as modern religious have turned their attention to the social implications of the Christian life, there has been a revival of interest in Allred and in the spiritual friendship. In the last few years, Alred's book has had two critical editions and been translated into French, German, and Italian. It was translated into English by C. H. Talbot in 1942, but wartime emergencies gave this version a very limited circulation. An English version of passages from the work of Sister M. F. Jerome was published in 1948. The present version is thus the first translation in English based on a fully critical text and available to the general public. It is to be hoped that it will make Alred's Christian humanism better known and more widely appreciated. Prologue when I was still just a lad at school, and the charm of my companions pleased me very much, I gave my whole soul to affection and devoted myself to love amid the ways and vices with which that age is wont to be threatened, so that nothing seemed to me more, more sweet, nothing more agreeable, nothing more practical, than to love. And so, torn between conflicting loves and friendships, I was drawn now here, now there, in not knowing the law of true friendship. I was often deceived by its mere semblance. At length there came to my hands a treatise which Tullius wrote on friendship, and it immediately appealed to me as being serviceable because the depth of his ideas in fascination because of the charm of his eloquence. And though I saw myself unfitted for that type of friendship, still I was gratified that I had discovered a formula for friendship whereby I might, I might check the vacillations of my loves and affections, when, in truth, it pleased our good Lord to reprove the wanderer, to lift the fallen, and with his healing touch to cleanse the leper, abandoning all worldly hopes, I entered a monastery. Immediately I gave my attention to the reading of holy books, whereas prior to that my eye, dimmed by the carnal darkness to which it had been accustomed, 
had not even a surface acquaintance with them. From that time on, sacred scripture became more attractive, and the little learning which I had acquired in the world grew insipid in comparison. The ideas I had gathered from Cicero's treatise on friendship kept recurring to my mind, and I was astonished that they no longer had for me their wanted savor. For now, nothing which had not been sweetened by the honey of the most sweet name of Jesus, nothing which had not been seasoned with the salt of sacred scripture, drew my affection so entirely to itself. Pondering over these thoughts, again and again, I began to ask myself whether they could perhaps have some support from Scripture. Since, however, I had already read many things on friendship in the writings of the saints, desiring this spiritual friendship, but not being able to attain it, I decided to write my own book on spiritual friendship and to draw up for myself rules for a chaste and holy love. Now, then, we have divided the work into three books. In the first, we study the nature of friendship, its source or cause. In the second, we propose its fruition and excellence. In the third, we explained, to the best of our ability, how and among whom it can be preserved unbroken, even to the end. Now, should anyone draw profit from reading this treatise, let him give thanks to God, and ask for Christ's mercy upon my sins. But if anyone deems what I have written superfluous or impractical, let him pardon my unhappy position, whose occupations forced me to put limits on the thought I could give to this meditation. Book One The Origin of Friendship Alred, here we are, you and I, and I hope a third. Christ is in our midst. There is no one now to disturb us. There is no one to break in upon our friendly chat. No man's prattle or noise of any kind will creep into this pleasant solitude. Come now, beloved, open your heart, and pour into these friendly ears whatsoever you will, and let us accept gracefully the boon of this place, time, and leisure. Just a little while ago, as I was sitting with the brethren, while all around were talking noisily, one questioning, another arguing, one advancing some point on sacred scripture, another information on vices, and yet another on virtue, you alone were silent. At times you would raise your head and make ready to say something, but just as quickly, as though your voice has been trapped in your throat, you would drop your head again and continue your silence. Then you would leave us for a while and later return looking rather disheartened. I concluded from all this that you wanted to talk to me, but that you dreaded the crowd and hoped to be alone with me. Ivo, that's it, exactly, and I deeply appreciate your solicitude for your son. His state of mind and his desire have been disclosed to you by none other than the spirit of love, and would that your lordship would grant me this favor, that, as often as you visit your sons here, that I may be permitted, at least once, to have you all to myself and to disclose to you the deep feelings within my heart without disturbance. Allred. Indeed, I shall do that, and gladly, for I am greatly pleased to see that you are not bent on empty and idle pursuits, but that you are always speaking of things useful and necessary for your progress. Speak freely, therefore, and entrust to your friend all your cares and thoughts, 
that you may both learn and teach, give and receive, pour out and drink in. Ivo, I am certainly ready to learn, not to teach, not to give, but to receive, to drink in, not to pour out. As indeed my youth demands of me, inexperience compels, and my religious profession exhorts, but that I may not foolishly squander on these considerations each time that I need for other matters, I wish that you would teach me something about spiritual friendship, namely its nature and values, its source and end, whether it can be cultivated amongst all, and if not amongst all, then by whom? How can it be preserved unbroken? and without any disturbance or misunderstanding be brought to a holy end. Alred, I wonder why you think it's proper to seek this information from me, since it is evident that there has been enough, and more, discussion on matters of this kind by ancient and excellent teachers, particularly since you spent your youth in studies of this sort, and I have read Cicero's treatise on friendship, which, in a delightful style, he treats the length of those matters which appear to pertain to friendship, and there he sets forth certain laws and precepts, so to speak, for friendship. Ivo. That treatise is not altogether unknown to me. In fact, at one time I took great delight in it. But since I began to taste some of the sweetness from the honeycomb of Holy Scripture, and since the sweet name of Christ claimed my affection for itself, whatever I henceforth read or hear, though it may be treated ever so subtly and eloquently, will have no relish or enlightenment for me if it lacks the salt of the heavenly books and the flavoring of that most sweet name. Therefore, those things which have already been said, even though they are in harmony with reason, and other things which the utility of the discussion demands that we treat, I should like proved to me with the authority of scriptures. I, th I should also like to be instructed more fully as to how the friendship which ought to exist among us begins in Christ, is preserved according to the Spirit of Christ, and how its end and fruition are referred to Christ. For it is evident that Tullius was unacquainted with the virtue of true friendship, since he was completely unaware of its beginning and end, Christ. Alred, I confess that I have been won over, but, not knowing myself or the extent of my own ability, I am not going to teach you anything about these matters, but rather to discuss them with you. For you yourself have opened the way for both of us, and have enkindled that brilliant light on the very threshold of our inquiry, which will not allow us to wander along unknown paths, but will lead us along the sure path to the certain goal of our proposed quest. For what more sublime can be said of friendship, what more, what more profitable than that it ought to, and is proved to, begin in Christ, and continue in Christ, and be perfected in Christ? Come now, tell me, what do you think you ought to be our first consideration in this matter of friendship? Ivo, in the first place, I think we should discuss the nature of friendship so as not to appear to be painting in emptiness, as we would indeed if we were unaware of the precise identity of that about which an ordered discussion on our part should proceed. Alred, 
But surely you are satisfied as a starting point with what Tullius says, are you not? Friendship is a mutual harmony in human affairs and divine coupled with benevolence and charity. Ivo, if that definition satisfies you, I agree that it satisfies me. Alred, in that case, those who have the same opinion, the same will, in matters human and divine, along with the mutual benevolence and charity, have, we shall admit, reached the perfection of friendship. Ivo, why not? But still, I do not see what the pagan Cicero meant by the word charity and benevolence. Alred, perhaps for him the word charity expresses an affection of the heart, and the word benevolence carrying it out indeed. For mutual harmony itself in matters human and divine ought to be dear to the hearts of both, that is, attractive and precious, and the carrying out of these works in actual practice ought to be both benevolent and pleasant. Ivo, I grant that this definition pleases me adequately, except I should not think it applied equally to pagans and Jews, and even to bad Christians. However, I confess that I am convinced that true friendship cannot exist among those who live without Christ. Alred, what follows will make it sufficiently clear to us whether the definition contains too much or too little, that it may either be rejected, or if, to say sufficient and not over-inclusive, be admitted. You can, however, get some idea of the nature of friendship from the definition, even though it should seem somewhat imperfect. Ivo, please, will it annoy you if I say that this definition does not satisfy me unless you unravel for me the meaning of the word itself? Alred, I shall be glad to comply with your wishes, if only you will pardon my lack of knowledge and not force me to teach you what I do not know. Now I think the word amicus, friend, comes from the word amor, love, and amicitia, friendship, from amicus. For love it is certain affection of the rational soul, whereby it seeks and eagerly strives after some object it possesses and enjoy it. Having attained its object through love, it enjoys it with a certain interior sweetness, embraces it, and preserves it. We have explained the affections and movements of love as clearly and carefully as we could in our mirror, with which you are already familiar. Furthermore, a friend is called a guardian of love, or, as some would have it, a guardian of the spirit itself, since it is fitting that my friend be a guardian of our mutual love or the guardian of my own spirit so as to preserve, preserve all its secrets in faithful silence, let him, as far as he can, cure and endure such defects as he may observe in it. Let him rejoice with his friend in his joys and weep with him in his sorrows and feel as his own all that his friend experiences. Friendship, therefore, is what virtue by the spirits are bound by ties of love and sweetness, and out of many are made one. Even the philosophers of this world have ranked friendship not with things casual or transitory, but with virtues which are eternal. Solomon in the Book of Proverbs appears to agree with them when he says, He that is a friend loves at all times. 
manifestly declaring that friendship is eternal, if it is true friendship. But if it should ever cease to be, then it was not true friendship, even though it seems to be so. Ivo, why is it then that we read about bitter that we read about bitter enmities arising between the most devoted friends. Alred, God willing, we shall discuss that matter more amply in its own space. Meantime, remember this. He was never a friend who could offend him, whom he at one time received into his friendship. On the other hand, that other has not tasted the delights of true friendship, who even when offended, has ceased to love him whom he has cherished. For he that is a friend loves at all times. Although he be accused unjustly, though he be injured, though he be cast in the flames, though he be crucified, he that is a friend loves at all times. Our Jerome speaks similarly. A friendship which can cease to be was never true friendship. Ivo. Since such perfection is expected to of true friendship, it is not surprising that those were so rare whom the ancients commended as true friends, as Tullius says, in so many ages past, tradition extols carefully three or four pairs of friends. But if in our day, that is, in this age of Christianity, friends are so few, it seems to me that I am exerting myself uselessly in striving after this virtue, which I, terrified by its admirable sublimity, now almost despair of ever acquiring. Allred. Effort in great things, as someone has said, is itself great. Hence it is the mark of a virtuous mind to reflect continually upon sublime and noble thoughts, that it maintain the desired object or understand more clearly and gain knowledge of what ought to be desired. Thus, too, he must be supposed to have advanced not a little whom he has learned by a knowledge of virtue, how he is from virtue himself. Indeed, the Christian ought not to despair of acquiring any virtue, since daily the, the divine voice from gospel re-echoes, Ask, and you shall receive. It is no wonder, then, that pursuers of true virtue were rare among the pagans, since they, since they did not know the Lord, the dispenser of virtue, of whom it is written, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Indeed, through faith in him, they were prepared to die for one another. I do not say three or four, but I offer you thousands of pairs of friends, although the ancients declared or imagined the devotion to Pilates and Orestes as great marvel. They were not, according to the definition of Tullius, strong in the virtue of true friendship, of whom it is written, and the multitude of believers had but one heart and one soul, neither did any one say what ought was his own, but all things were common unto them. How could they fail to have good complete agreement on all things divine and human with charity and benevolence, seeing that they had but one heart and one soul. How many martyrs gave their lives for their brethren? 
How many spared neither cost nor even physical torments? I am sure you have often read, and that not dry-eyed, about the girl of Antioch rescued from a house of ill repute by a fine bit of strategy on the part of a certain soldier. Sometimes later, he who she had discovered as a guardian of her chastity in that house of ill repute became her companion in martyrdom. I might go on citing many examples of this kind. Did not the danger of verboseness forbid, and their very abundance enjoin us to be silent? For Christ, Jesus, announced their coming. He spoke, and they were multiplied above number. Greater love than this, he says, no man has, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ivo, are we then to believe that there is no difference between charity and friendship? Allred, on the contrary, there is a vast difference, for divine authority proves that more are to be received into the bosom of charity than into the embrace of friendship. For we are compelled by the law of charity to receive in the embrace of love not only our friends, but also our enemies. But only those do we call friends to whom we can fearlessly entrust our heart and all its secrets. Those, too, who in turn are bound to us by the same law of faith and security. Ivo, how many persons leading a worldly existence and acting as partners in some form of vice are united by similar packs and find the bond of even that sort of friendship to be more pleasant and sweet than all the delights of this world? I hope that you will not find it burdensome to isolate, as it were, from the company of so many types of friendships, that one which we think should be called spiritual to distinguish it from others, which it is to some extent bound up and confused, in which a cost and clamor for the attention of those who seek and long for it. For by contrasting them, you would make spiritual friendship better known to us and consequently more desirable and thus more actively arouse and fire us to this acquisition allred falsely do they claim the illustrious name of friends among whom there exists a harmony of vices since he who does not love is not a friend but he does not love his fellow men whom he loves iniquity. For he that loves iniquity does not love, but hates his own soul. Truly, he who does not love his own soul will not be able to love the soul of another. Thus it follows that they glory only in the name of friendship and are deceived by a distorted image and are supported by truth. Yet, since such great joy is experienced in friendship, which either lust defiles, avarice dishonors, or luxury pollutes, we may infer how much sweetness that friendship possesses, which, in proportion as it is nobler, it is more secure. Purer, it is the more pleasing. Freer, it is the more happy. Let us allow that, because of some similarity in feelings, though friendships which are not true be, nevertheless, called friendships, provide, however, that they are judiciously distinguished from that friendship which is spiritual and therefore true. Hence, let one kind of friendship be called carnal, another worldly, and another spiritual. 
The carnal springs from mutual harmony and vice. The worldly is enkindled by the hope of gain. And the spiritual is cemented by similarity of life, morals, and pursuits among the just. The real beginning of carnal friendship proceeds from an affection, which is like a harlot directs its step after every passerby. Following its own lustful ears and eyes in every direction, by means of the avenues of these senses, brings it into mind itself images of beautiful bodies or voluptuous objects. To enjoy these as he pleases the carnal man thinks its blessedness, but to enjoy them without an associate he considers less delightful. Then by gesture, nod, word, compliance, spirit is captivated by spirit, and one is inflamed by the other, and they are kindled to form a sinful bond so that after they have entered upon such a deplorable pact, the one will do or suffer any crime or sacrilege, whatever, for the sake of the other. They consider nothing sweeter than this type of friendship, and they judge nothing more equable, believing community of like and dislike to be imposed upon them by the laws of friendship. And so, this sort of friendship is undertaken without deliberation. It is tested by no act of judgment. It is in no wise governed by reason, but through the violence of affection is carried away through diverse paths, observing no limit, caring not for uprightness, foreseeing neither gains nor losses, but advancing towards everything needlessly, indiscriminately, lightly and immoderately. For that reason, goaded on as if by furies, it is consumed by its own self, or is dissolved with the same levity with which it was originally fashioned. But worldly fashion, with which is born, of a desire for temporal advantage or possessions is always full of deceit and intrigue. It contains nothing certain, nothing constant, nothing secure. For, to be sure, it ever changes with fortune and follows the purse. Hence it is written, He is your fair-weather friend, and he will not abide in the day of your trouble. Take away his hope of profit, and immediately he will cease to be a friend. This type of friendship, the following lines very aptly deride. A friend, not of the man, but of his purse, is he, held fast by fortune fair, by evil made to flee. And yet the beginning of this vicious friendship leads many individuals to a certain degree of true friendship, those namely who at first enter into the compact of friendship in the hope of common profit while they cherish it in themselves in baneful riches, and who, in so far as human affairs are concerned, reach an acme of pleasing mutual agreement. But a friendship ought to in no wise be called true which is begun and preserved for the sake of some temporal advantage. For spiritual friendship, which we call true, should be desired not for consideration of any worldly advantage or any intrinsic cause, but from the dignity of its own nature and the feeling of the human heart, so that its fruition and reward is nothing other than itself. Whence the Lord in the Gospel says, I have appointed you that you should go, and should bring forth fruit. That is, that you should love one another. For true friendship advances by perfecting itself, and the fruit is derived 
from feeling the sweetness of that perfection. And so the spiritual friendship among the just is born of a similarity in life, morals, and pursuits, that is, with a mutual conformity in, in matters human and divine, united with benevolence and charity. Indeed, this definition seems to me to be adequate for representing friendship. If, however, charity is, according to our way of thinking, named in the sense of that friendship excludes every vice, then benevolence expresses the feeling of to love which is pleasantly roused interiorly. Where such friendship exists, there, indeed, is a community of likes and dislikes, the more pleasant in proportion, as it is more sincere, the more agreeable as it is more sacred. Those who love in his way can will nothing that is unbecoming, and reject nothing that is expedient. Sure, such friendship prudence directs, justice rules, fortitude guards, and temperance moderates. But these matters we shall speak in their place. Now, then, tell me whether you think enough has been said about the matter you first brought up, namely the nature of friendship. Ivo, your explanation is certainly sufficient and nothing else suggests itself to me for further inquiry. But before we go on to other things, I should like to know how friendship first originated among men. Was it by nature, by chance, or by necessity of some kind? Or did it come into practice by some statute or law imposed upon the human race, and did practice then commend it to man.